Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Lord, how my foes increase. There are many who attack me. Many say about me, there is no help for him in God. Salah. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. Silah. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of thousands of people who have taken their stand against me on every side. Rise up, Lord. Save me, my God. You strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. May your blessings be on your people. Silah. What a passage to have for Father's Day. Here are the words of a weeping father fleeing from his son. 2 Samuel 15 tells us that David was climbing the slope of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he ascended. His head was covered and he was walking barefoot. All of the people with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they ascended. Thankfully, not many fathers have to flee from their sons. Absalom had killed one of his half-brothers and had been banished from Jerusalem. David has allowed him to return after a number of years. And eventually David demonstrates publicly that he's forgiven Absalom. He kisses him on the cheek in the court. And in return for David's forgiveness, what does Absalom do? He undermines the throne, he steals the loyalty of the people and David has to flee. Like so many royal sons, Absalom has grown impatient to become king. He wants the power and all the benefits of being king and he doesn't want to wait. David has many sons and given Absalom's past actions, it's unlikely David's going to choose him as his successor. So Absalom comes up with a plan. He successfully draws the people of Israel away from David. David gets a last minute warning of what Absalom is up to and he flees with most of his household. He does it very uh, unpreparedly, hence walking barefoot up the mountain. And this is the circumstance that brings about this psalm. And the psalm is an insight into David's feelings and thoughts as he flees from his own son. Imagine the grief. Imagine the pain of betrayal. And so this psalm brings us David's thoughts about his terrible situation. Let me pray before we look at the psalm today. Lord Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the humanness that is in it sometimes. Here is a father fleeing in great distress. We thank you for this insight into you and into how your faithful people live. Father, as we look at this passage today, be with us, teach us. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's have a look at the first couple of verses now. There's a lie here. Lord, how my foes increase. There are many who attack me. Many say about me, there is no help for him in God. Now, as David flees, there are discussions back in Jerusalem about how many men to send after David to try and kill him. 
The conspirators think they can raise 12,000 men to pursue David. Because Absalom has planned so well, most of Israel is now following him. David knows the situation. He knows that he now has many enemies among the people. The conspirators think they have David on the run and they have successfully deprived him of all his support and that they can kill him whenever they please. And they think God cannot save him. He's only alive for as long as it takes us to catch up with him. Oh, the pride of men, the lies they tell themselves. There's no salvation for him in God. That's what the conspirators think. God cannot save him now. We have Jerusalem. We have the people. It's only a matter of time. In these circumstances, there has to be a strong temptation for David to believe the lie that many around him are saying. There's no salvation for him in God. It would be easy to think just like everyone else. God won't save me this time. One of the people who has gone over to Absalom was Ahithophel. David's chief advisor, a man he'd trusted and listened to for many years. And Ahithophel is now advising Absalom. Ahithophel sounds like a true pragmatist. He's seen which way the wind's blowing. The people are flowing to Absalom. And so he switches allegiances rather than lose out when Absalom takes power. For David, all must seem very dark. It wouldn't be hard to slide into thinking, there's no hope. Everyone's against me. Even God cannot save me from this. Is that a lie we hear? Many say it of our souls. There's no salvations for Christians in God. God does not save. There is no God. There's nothing to be saved from. The reasoning is different, but the same lie results. And so many people around us believe that lie and live their lives as if it is true. The priests and the scribes believe the same lie as they watched Jesus on the cross. They said, he trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. When the crowds mocked him as he carried the cross to Calvary, when the Romans mocked him as they beat him, when the disciples deserted him for fear of their lives, our Lord was surrounded by that same lie. There is no salvation for him in God. But there is that important three-letter word which begins verse 3. And it comes immediately after the lie. But... But David knows how hollow this lie is. He knows that the way things look for him at the moment is only a passing illusion. Let me read those verses. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, he answers me from his holy mountain. David is surely in an awful situation. His own son, the son he has forgiven for a horrendous evil, has turned on David and now appears to have David's life at his mercy. But, but David knows 
that God is his shield. He knows this because God has shielded him from the likes of Saul and Goliath. He knows this because God has saved him so many times in the past. God is his shield all about. That's on every side. And God is not only his protection. God is also his glory. David knows he has no glory of his own. All the things that he has managed to achieve in his life have been given him by God. Any glory that David has is merely a demonstration of God's glory through him. But God also gives David hope. David's head is continually lifted up in hope and in praise. He is not downcast. His circumstances might be awful, but he knows that God remains constant and therefore David has hope and he has comfort. And he also knows that God answers when he calls. When he calls out to his holy mountain, he knows that the Lord answers. In so many seemingly hopeless situations in the past, God has kept David safe. Out of all those really grim times, God has managed to give David such success and has lifted him up to make him king of God's own chosen people. God has done so many things for him and through him. David knows that this God, this saving, glorifying God, has not and will not change. So David has this dilemma. Believe what the people are saying or continue to trust that God will do as he has done in the past. Now, when our kids were in primary school, we used to play a little game in the backyard at times with our trampoline. They'd bounce down the trampoline and then dive out horizontally and I'd catch them. When we first started, I had to stand fairly close to the trampoline and when they dived out, their feet would be underneath them so that they'd land on their feet in case I didn't catch them. They didn't trust me. But as time went on and I caught them time after time, I would move further and further from the trampoline and they'd dive out more and more horizontally. I enjoyed the game. I think they did too. As a father, I could not break the trust they had put in me and just let them hit the ground. Imagine someone saying to them, your dad won't catch you. What do you think they would have said? But dad always catches me. We see David's resolution of his dilemma in verses 5 and 6. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of thousands of people who have taken their stand against me on every side. David continues to trust God. God has always saved him in the past. I read a sermon on this passage titled How to Get a Good Night's Sleep. Because of God's past action for him, David sleeps well. Do you struggle to get a good night's sleep because your circumstances make you anxious? David rests peacefully, unafraid of his many enemies. We heard last week how we can rest in our Lord. I don't know your situation. I don't know what keeps you awake. Or what helps you to rest well? But here is a man who finds peaceful rest 
in the character of God. He sleeps the sleep of the untroubled. He is not afraid of what men can do to him. He is not afraid because of what men say. He is not led astray by the lies they tell. He may have doubts when he hears so many people saying God will not save him, but but he knows the God who has saved him and lifted him up and given him hope will continue to save him. And so David does not continue in doubt. He sleeps well. He wakes in the morning well rested and thanks the Lord. The evidence of God's sustaining mercies surround him and he believes them over and above the lies that many men tell him. And so he is unafraid. And because he knows that God, and because that God has answered him in the past and that God does not change, David turns again to God and he makes an appeal in verse 7. Rise up, Lord. Save me, my God. You strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Now, back at the start of this sermon, when I was telling us where we were in relation to the events with Absalom and David, I left out something important. All the events of Absalom's attack on David are at God's institution. Let me read from 2 Samuel 12, verses 11 and 12. It's part of God's judgment upon David and his house for his sin with Bathsheba. We know that God sentences the child that is conceived to die, but God has an extra judgment on David's house as well. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives from before your eyes and give them to your neighbour and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son for you did it secretly but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Now what happens is when Absalom arrives at the palace in Jerusalem one of the first things he does is to go and lie with David's wives and concubines. And to display that he's doing this, he sets up a tent on the roof of the house where they all live, so it's obvious that he's going in and out to the wives and concubines. All these events are at God's institution. Absalom thinks he's engineering events so he can overthrow his father. In actual fact, it's God's judgment on David and his house coming to fulfilment. David knows this. He has not forgotten what God has said. So he's under God's judgment. But what does he do? He appeals to God to save him. David's knowledge of God is large enough to include a God who saves from his own judgment. He's in this situation because of his sin with Bathsheba. There is no other who can save David. There is only one saviour from the consequences of our sin. There is only one saviour from God's righteous judgment, and that is God himself. And so David appeals to God to save him. Now here is the unchanging, solid, certain rock of our hope. It is Jesus our Saviour. 
In Isaiah 45, the prophet gives us God's words. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a saviour. There is none besides me. Who saves? God alone. How does David put it in, in, in verse 8 of Psalm 3? Salvation belongs to the Lord. It is God alone who saves and it's part of his character to be the saviour. All salvation comes from him. Salvation belongs to him. It comes from no other. In the past, you might have been saved by some happy circumstance in a car accident. Like Jess, you might have been saved by your father from unfortunate accidents. You might have been rescued from drowning in the surf. In all of these events, it is God who saved you. Salvation belongs to him. There is no one else who saves. David knew this. He appealed to the one who has saved him countless times before. Now you might say, my life's never had such a situation. You've never had your life threatened. I say to you, remember that these events that David is facing are God's righteous judgment on him. And are we not all under God's judgment? Have we not all sinned? And the good news, of course, is if you know Jesus as Saviour, you too know that he is your shield all around. He is your glory and he lifts your head and he gives you hope. This whole psalm is a reminder against a lie. And it is David shoring up his defences against that lie. The circumstances David is in would seem to say the lie is true. There is evidence that God has deserted him. But it's an illusion. Remember what God has done for each of us. David remembers what God has done and he turns again to that God. God has saved him before. He is confident he will again. For that reason and for many other reasons, God deserves in the full sense of the word to be given praise and glory as the one who saves. That's right and true. Salvation belongs to the Lord and to him alone. Remember, he is a jealous God. He will not let the praise and honour which are his due be given to another. We heard in Revelation chapter 7 earlier, there is a great multitude from every nation standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb, Jesus. In verse 10, this multitude is crying out, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It's interesting that that is one of the things God is praised for in Revelation. And to look elsewhere for salvation is to not give the praise and the honour where it is due and right to do so. It is to give someone or something else what belongs to God. We often hear of God's mercy. We often hear of God's justice or his faithfulness or his love. 
There are so many lovely and perfect things about who God is. But here in this psalm, in Isaiah 45 and in Revelation, it is clear that God is a saving God. Salvation belongs to the Lord, a righteous God and a saviour. There is none other besides him. Because of this, I can say, be at peace, brothers and sisters. Do not listen to the lies of this world. Many will tell you that God will not save you. But remember the great thing that God has done in and through Jesus and therefore rest in him. Do not fear men. They cannot harm your soul. If you belong to Jesus, you are well and truly safe already and God is your shield all around. Let me pray. Lord Heavenly Father, um, circumstances often seem difficult, often seem dreadful, and we can get tied up in our pain and anguish and forget to look to you. Father, forgive us. Thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus, for his saving action on our behalf. And thank you that we are safe in him, protected all around from your judgment. And we pray in his name. Amen.